Hi, everyone. I want to welcome you to the very first episode of Ready for November. It's a conversation series that we are hosting at the Department of State in which every week we'll explore the work that is being done to ensure that Michigan is ready for the November 3rd general election. Now here at the Department of State, we are working every day to prepare, uh, but we're not alone. Uh, democracy is a team sport, as I always say, and there are many people all around the state working on your behalf to make sure that in every corner, in every county, we're ready to go to ensure that our elections in November are safe, accessible, and secure. So today, I want to talk about some of the policy changes we need to make to ensure that we're ready for November and to introduce to you, and many of you already know these folks, three leaders in our legislature who have introduced legislation that is directly going to help us prepare for the election. Uh, so here today, we have State Senator Jeremy Moss, who has been our election champion in the Senate. He represents the 11th Senate District in Southern Oakland County. We also have State Representative Vanessa Guerra. She represents the 95th House District, which includes the cities of Saginaw and Zilwaukee and several townships in Saginaw County. She's also the Vice Chair for the House Elections and Ethics Committee and has been a terrific leader and ally for democracy uh, as a leader on that committee. And we also have State Representative Youssef Rabi. He represents the 53rd House District, and that includes parts of the city in Ann Arbor and surrounding townships. Uh, thank you all for joining me today to discuss the legislative work that you are championing as we work together to prepare for the November elections. And, uh, and so there are a number of legislative policies we're championing. The first one I want to talk about is about processing ballots that are sent through the mail prior to election day. Now, as we saw in August, many of our counties, including four of our largest counties, could not report the results of our elections until late in the following afternoon. Uh, and some election workers were forced to work more than 20 hours straight uh, to, in, to count on process all these ballots, which, which only increases the chance of error. And all this is happening as more citizens than ever before are voting by mail. In fact, in our August primary, 1.6 million citizens chose to vote prior to election day and either drop off their ballots with their clerk, return them at a drop box, or mail them in. As all of those ballots were received, all the clerks could do was put them in a pile and prepare them to be, to be processed on election day morning. Now in other states, that's not the case. Uh, the, in other states, in many other states, including Florida, Ohio, Kentucky, the process begins sooner and clerks can begin processing those ballots as they get them so that on election day, all you do is count them some even count them prior to election day and, and keep them in a secure place so that no results are known or no tabulation uh, is, is, is done uh, or released until election day itself. But it's all geared towards making sure the process runs efficiently and effectively on election day itself and that we reduce the potential for human error and more uh, results get delivered as efficiently as possible. So I wanna uh, talk to Senator Moss, uh, who has a bill in the Senate with some bipartisan support. Uh, Senator Moss, uh, can you tell us a little bit about its chances for passage? Yeah, so even rewinding back to before this pandemic, in Proposal 3, we expanded access for Michiganders to vote absentee. And, and, and it was the winningest thing on the ballot in 2018. People in Michigan demanded some 67% voted in favor of no reason absentee. And we're encouraging that uh, because the people of this state want that as an option. Um, and not as a barrier. And so back in uh, February, the Senate uh, Elections Committee took up a package of legislation um, to anticipate that more people in Michigan would be voting absentee and allowing for some of those pre-processing measures like opening up the envelope the day before, still maintaining the secrecy and integrity of that vote, but allowing some of that pre-processing things uh, those pre-processing things to be done a day earlier so that you can continue the process uh, once all the votes are counted the next day. So that was before the pandemic that these bills passed uh, 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 with bipartisan support out of the Senate Elections Committee in February. Then the pandemic hit, and of course now we need more than ever uh, uh, to promote absentee voting so that there aren't these clusters of people at the polls. We can keep poll workers safe, we can keep voters safe, they can vote for the, from the convenience of their kitchen table. 
And we now more than ever need those provisions to ease the burden on election workers to process these absentee ballots uh, that will be coming in at historic numbers, not only due to Proposal 3, but due to the pandemic. And they have moved out of committee uh, and they sit on the Senate floor unmoved. Uh, and this is something that is common sense, uh, has bipartisan support, uh, and, and we really need to enact this so we can have results as quickly and as accurately as possible. Uh, clerks around the state are, are begging for this, uh, are asking for this, uh, and are pushing for this. Uh, and so this is uh, something that should not be delayed as much as it has uh, for the entirety of this year uh, with no Senate action. So I'm, I'm, I'm counting on folks to contact their senators and push for Senate Bill 757 to get that pre-processing rolling so we can get those absentee voters uh, votes counted. And so that on election night, when the eyes of the country around Michigan were able to uh, deliver our results as efficiently as possible uh, with, uh, and, and as effectively and accurately as possible. It's such an important policy. And Representative Guerra, I know in some of the other 18 states that do allow early processing, they allow more than one day. I mean, Florida offers more than three weeks, for example. Uh, you introduced a bill that would give Michigan clerks more time. Can you tell us about it and why it's important? Yeah, so as uh, Senator Moss mentioned, this is legislation that we had worked on, again, before the pandemic, recognizing there was going to be an increase in absentee uh, ballots. And so our bill would allow clerks seven days. Um, they don't have to use all seven days. It's up to their local community to decide what works best for them. And really, we started with seven days, recognizing that there'll probably be some compromise, uh, working with our colleagues on the other side to find a um, happy medium for them. Um, you know, the pre-processing bill that's introduced in the Senate, we would be very grateful to see that move. But even as recently as this past week, uh, we've had testimony testimony from local clerks as they're reflecting about August say, you know, a day would be nice, but more than one day would be even better. And that's because they are overloaded. Um, you know, no matter how hard our poll workers, um, you know, how much effort they put in because they're dedicated to, it's really a craft for them. We get the same poll workers coming back all the time. Uh, but no matter the knowledge that they have, they can only go as fast as they can. Um, and as you mentioned, it's done in other states. Um, overall, 28 other states have some form of pre-processing. So it's not a, a new novel idea. It's something that we could absolutely achieve here in Michigan. That's great. And I'm grateful for both of you for leading on that and continuing to champion data-driven solutions uh, for not just our voters, but for our clerks. And another big uh, concern ahead of the November election is a very specific kind of voter disenfranchisement, which in our August primary impacted more than 2,000 Michigan citizens. Our signature verification process, when someone mails in a ballot, is one of the ways that we secure the process of mail-in voting or voting by mail or voting absentee because it allows us to confirm someone's identity. If someone signs the envelope outside the ballot uh, that in which the ballot's returned, and that signature is then matched the signature we have on file for them. Uh, now, right now, if a ballot is returned with an envelope and there's no signature on it, or if the signature doesn't match the voter, the signature that we have for the voter on file, the clerks are not required to do anything other than not count the ballot. They're not required to follow up with someone if there's an issue with a missing ballot signature um, or if something doesn't seem to match. Now, some do voluntarily, and, and that's one of the best ways you can both ensure that we're not throwing out a ballot that otherwise should be counted or that you're, you're uncovering any irregularities as they occur. Uh, but that said, uh, we believe if you're casting a valid vote, uh, we don't want it to get tossed because you forget to sign the envelope, especially because so many people are going to be voting by mail for the first time and may not be familiar with all the rules, um, or because your handwriting was a little sloppy or your signature has changed. Uh, Representative Robbie, you've introduced a bill to address this issue. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Absolutely. Yeah. House Bill uh, 5991 uh, does exactly what you're talking about. This is about ensuring that every vote gets counted. And too often we have, as you said, 2,000 uh, voters just in this last election um, and with higher turnout uh, in November, hopefully, um, we may see, uh, unfortunately, even more. What we really want to do is make sure that every vote gets counted. And in addition to folks uh, simply forgetting to sign uh, their, their, ba their absentee ballot, um, there are other instances, too, I think, where you can have someone who uh, is maybe uh, uh, elderly or has trouble seeing um, that's trying to sign the back of their uh, ballot 
Um, and it just doesn't look the way that it used to look when they first signed and, and that signature that they have, uh, that, you, that you have on file uh, just may not look exactly the same. And so when those poll workers are going through uh, each of those ballots and they have to look at the match, um, if there's a mismatch, all my bill says is that those local clerks would notify the voters of, hey, there's a mismatch or, hey, you forgot to sign the back of your ballot. And it gives them an opportunity to then correct that signature um, and to ensure that, that uh, their ballot and their vote gets counted. This is about making sure that our democracy is strong and that every single voter has a chance to cast their ballot and be counted. Uh, this is what democracy is all about. And that's what the bills that we're talking about today are all about. Uh, and thank you uh, to our wonderful Secretary of State. You've been a champion on these issues, making sure that everybody has an opportunity to vote. And it's time for the legislature to step up as well and do its part to make sure that every vote gets counted in the state of Michigan. I couldn't agree more. And we're grateful for your leadership and all of you for really championing these important changes that are really in many ways simply updating our current election laws to match the, the voters demand that they be able to vote and have a right to vote by mail, which is now enshrined in our law. And importantly, the expansion of that right to vote by mail, which has led to, again, more people voting by mail than ever before in our state, has also led to a number of ballots that are sent prior to election day, but received after election day to not be counted because our current law says that all ballots have to be in by 8 p.m. on election day. Now that works if most people are voting in person, but when the majority of citizens are voting by mail or early, and uh, particularly if they drop their ballot in the mail on time, but for reasons that are no fault of their own, it gets delayed and is received the day after election day or the day after that, it should still count. In many cases, in most jurisdictions, we're talking about just a handful of votes here and there, but the focus needs to be on making sure that every valid vote that is cast on time counts. Now, in the August primary, we saw more than 6,000 ballots rejected because of late arrivals. They were sent and postmarked prior to election day, but they were received the day or two after. We believe that Michigan should be a state like many others, where, where no voter is disenfranchised because through no fault of their own, the post office is late in delivering the mail. Representative Garrett, can you talk about what's being done to address this issue, hopefully in time for November in Lansing right now? Yes, uh, so our bill, uh, House Bill 5987, uh, would allow uh, clerks to accept uh, ballots that have been postmarked by election day, but received up to 48 hours after election day to still be counted. So anything after 48 hours, even if it is postmarked, uh, would not be counted. And again, we just wanted to have um, some structure there because obviously we can't say, you know, three weeks from now, a month from now, uh, we had to put in some some regulation there. And so uh, so this would help voters to ensure that their ballots are counted. Um, your office released really helpful information so that local communities can identify um, how many folks that happened to just in August. And I know I took a look at ours right away. And you're right, it's not, you know, thousands of people in these communities necessarily. Um, but it is a lot of folks who, you know, again, no fault of their own, or maybe even they're new to absentee voting and didn't realize the earlier they're better just because, you know, they did it before election day and up, you know up until now not everybody could utilize uh, absentee voting the way that they are now and so um, again just ensuring that every vo voice is heard and making sure that people's um, ballots are counted especially when they have followed the rules and done everything they can to make it by election day but for some reason it doesn't arrive until you know a day or two after the election. Right and now importantly uh, as we lead into November there's been a lot of uncertainty and changes in the Postal Service, how does that impact the need for this legislation? Yes, so um, similar to a previous legislation, again, this was something we talked about before all of the concerns around the Postal Service came up. Um, and now that we do have those concerns and really so much hesitation from folks about you know, what happens? Do I just not turn my ballot in at all if I'm, you know, a few days before the election and they don't have the means of transportation, which is a very real thing in many communities. Um, oftentimes we're the automobile state, so people assume everybody has access to transportation, and that's not the case. Many folks rely heavily both in our urban and rural communities um, on the USPS, and when there are delays there, it impacts their lives not only with prescriptions and all other sorts of important things, but also um, their right to participate in our democracy. Right. And so, uh, yeah, it certainly is as there are political decisions being made uh, in Washington that can affect all of those things, as you mentioned, we want to ensure 
uh, that the, the uncertainties in the Postal Service don't create uncertainties for our voters in any way. And so thank you for the legislation you're championing to, uh, to, to make sure that doesn't happen. And you know, talking about those delays brings up another significant issue because when we talk, we're, we're talking about domestic voters who choose to vote by mail, but there's also folks overseas that have really uniquely limited access to the mail right now. And yet they want to vote in, in many ways, in nearly every case, their only option is to return their ballot by mail. We can't put a drop box on every army base and in every country throughout the world. And if, even if we did, I don't know how to secure them and I'm sure they're accessible to all. So ensuring that ballots are able to be returned for our, over, for our citizens overseas and for those serving in the military is, is something we really need to focus on for November. Um, many of you know that, uh, that I have personal experience with this, with this challenge. And I'll tell you, as a military spouse, there are, um, I, I have um, you know, probably one of the most challenging moments of uh, the past two years that I've served as Secretary of State, Representative Guerra, was sitting uh, before your committee with and alongside military spouses and veterans testifying about a bill that would allow for the electronic return of ballots securely through a secure portal for members of the military, but not their spouses. It's to me a nonsensical delineation to say if you're a service member in the military, you can return your ballot through the electronic portal that's secure and in place in many states. But if you're married to someone and serving overseas with them, or if you're a kid, a dependent, and of age, and in, ser in serving overseas also on orders because military families all serve together, you don't have that same access. You've got to mail your ballot in. Uh, if it passed without amendment, it would be, uh, the, would make, it would make Michigan the only state in the country to give access to the vote more easily to military service members, but not extend that to their spouses or family members. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that and, you know, why you think that there's been so, I mean, I, I, you voted in support of an amendment. I think you proposed an amendment uh, to ensure spouses and their dependents were included. That was voted down by uh, the Republican members of the committee in lockstep, which was uh, something I'll never forget seeing personally. Uh, and it was um, very disappointing. Um, but can you tell me a little bit more about why you think it, it's it's really a, a, it's not a partisan issue, but yet it was your amendment was was voted down on partisan lines? Yeah, I, you know I always say um, you know we have all of these veterans events where they invite politicians to come and speak, and I think that if we're going to support our uh, men and women and families that are serving overseas, um, that we have to do that 100 percent, and that means in every way make their lives over there as easy um, and as really normal as we can because they're serving our country. And one way that we do that is ensuring that they're able to submit their ballots in a way that is convenient um, and secure. And so that's what my amendment would have done. Um, as you mentioned, it was not supported. Um, hoping that we can come back and convince those other colleagues of mine that this is something that's important um, because every vote matters. Um, and, and frankly, you know, just the thought of what they give to our country, what they do for our country, you know, it's, it's the members themselves, but also the sacrifices their family made, their families have made. Um, and it would be really just a small thank you to be able to mm -hmm. allow them to participate in our democracy like every other American citizen is able to in this country. Yeah, well, thank you for standing with our service members and their families. Uh, it means a lot. Uh, speaking as someone who has personal experience, who's from that community, uh, it, you never forget those who stand with you uh, and express their gratitude for your service in words and in actions. And you never forget those who don't. Uh, so I appreciate you being on the right side of that issue. And, and as you said, I hope that others come around and see uh, the right thing to do for our, our military service members and their families. Uh, finally, I want to mention uh, that both Representative Guerra and Senator Moss have introduced legislation to provide paid time off uh, for people uh, to serve on Election Day as poll workers or otherwise vote uh, on Election Day. Senator Moss, could you tell us a little bit more about that? And by the way, thank you for proposing that legislation. <laughs> yeah, and thank you for your partnership on this one. This, again, is where Michigan lags behind. Most other states offer paid time off. Uh, for workers to take leave from their job during the day on election day to go vote. And I'm talking across the political divide. This is, this is implemented in Wyoming and South Dakota and New York and California. Michigan is one of the very few states 
that does not allow working people to have time off from work to go vote. And, and you know, obviously now we're encouraging people to uh, uh, utilize mail-in voting because of the pandemic, but normal times will resume. And I like to vote at the polls on election day, as do many people. And so we want to make sure that there are no barriers, that there is more access for working people to exercise their right to vote. And so this is something that uh, Representative Gara and I have joined together with you uh, as Secretary of State uh, to propose a solution here to make Michigan uh, yet another state that joins the majority of states um, that gives a, a little bit of, of uh, help to people who have restrictive schedules, who have an inflexibility on election day in those, in those hours between 7 a.m. and 8 p.m. to tell their employer, I'm gonna take a couple of hours uh, as needed uh, during election day to go to the polls and exercise uh, my right to vote. Um, so uh, voters deserve more access and less barriers to voting and, and, and providing for their family uh, shouldn't be one of those barriers. They should be able to uh, earn a paycheck make a living and also exercise the right in our democracy uh, and other states have figured out how to do it uh, and so we're just trying to get michigan to join the growing list of states across the country that have provided this for working families absolutely uh, and thank you for your leadership on that i think all of you are really championing this legislation not for any partisan uh, reason it's just simply what the data shows is best for all voters of all backgrounds and perspectives and so i'm just grateful for you looking at the data and making you know, solutions um, uh, to the problems that uh, have impacted our state in ways that, that um, others have not. And Michigan citizens can involve themselves on these issues by contacting your legislators and legislative leaders to let them know uh, that you want these measures passed. Indeed, that is the only thing that has really moved legislation like this before when uh, voters demand it. And, uh, you know, in, in addition to voting, the will of the people can be conveyed through a phone call, or email, or letter to members of the legislature. Uh, and Representative Robbie, I uh, wanted to give you an opportunity to share any parting thoughts uh, on all these issues and any advice to those watching on what they can do to join you all in the effort to champion these important issues. Absolutely, and thank you, uh, Secretary Benson, again, for your leadership in this uh, area. And you, you said it exactly right. This is where the people of the state of Michigan can step up and demand. This is a nonpartisan issue. This is something that gets to the very core of who we are as Americans and what this democracy means to us. That's what this is about. And so when you step up and you call your state representative or your state senator, or frankly, when you call your aunt or uncle who you may not have talked with in a little while, uh, who maybe lives in a different part of the state, who maybe thinks a little bit differently than you, call them up, have a conversation about how important democracy is to you and encourage them to contact their senators and their representatives and ask them to, uh, to make a call to their elected officials to make sure that their voices are being heard uh, so that all Michiganders have the right and the ability to cast a vote in a fair and safe election. We need to stand behind our fantastic Secretary of State, but more importantly, we need to stand behind our democracy and the people of the state of Michigan to make that happen. So thank you again, Secretary Benson, for all your fantastic work. And to my two colleagues, uh, Senators Moss and Representative Garrett, you're amazing and you're doing good work. And I'll hand it back over to you, Secretary Benson. Thank you, Representative. Uh, and thank you for joining us from the great outdoors. It's a true Ann Arbor <laughs> representative. Um, and that brings us to the end of our first show. I want to thank all of you, uh, Senator Moss, Representative Garrett, Representative Ravi, for taking time to join me for this important discussion and for all the work you're doing and have done throughout your careers to ensure that every vote counts, that every voice is heard, and for working with me and on behalf of voters all across the state to ensure that we're ready for November. Uh, thanks again, and everyone, if you're not already following our great leaders, uh, legislative leaders on Twitter and social media, please do, uh, and don't forget to vote this fall. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>